Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. He will never change. But you must change. The alleged cover-up by leaders of the Southern Baptist Convention. The report lists hundreds of ministers accused of sexual abuse. We are believing for 200,000 people to give contributions of 300 U.S. dollars or more. Hey, good evening. Great to be with you. Uh, I want to ask a question real quick, show of hands. Does anyone still, not still, like, okay, but does anyone wash their hands, <laughs> their hands, their dishes? Does anyone wash their hands, show of hands? Okay, does anyone wash their dishes with, like, the old-fashioned way with, like, just water and soap in a, in a sink and then dry them? Anyone still do that? All right, it is 2022, people, but um, there's these things called dishwashers. And so I'm going to tell you a story, but I need you to guard your heart, okay, as I tell this story, because I can, I can already sense a little bit of the eye rolls happening. But I noticed not too long ago that my dishwasher was, was broken, I guess. I mean, it's still washing dishes, but it wasn't drying dishes, which is like half of the function of a dishwasher. And so I didn't really know what was going on, and I kind of just ignored the problem, hoping that it was, you know, would go away. Which, by the way, is an excellent way to deal with most problems in life, okay? Just if you get anything out of tonight, please, God, don't let it be that. Um, but my wife started to notice as well that, that it was leaving like these water droplets on all the dishes. And so we'd have to take them off and we'd have to dry them with the towel. And it's getting frustrating. So my wife wanted me to fix this thing. And I know absolutely nothing about dishwashers, but I'm cheap. And so I don't want to buy a new one. I'm not doing that. And I also don't want to call a repair person. So I just set my mind to fixing this dishwasher. Washer. So I'm Googling it, YouTubing, and I figure out, okay, most likely it's the heating element that is wrong with my, with my dishwasher. And so I got the part, I shut off the power, shut off the water, I moved out the dishwasher, I disconnected the supply line, disconnected the drain, I opened it up, I took out the part, replaced the part, put it all back together, reconnected everything, turned on for a cycle, and guess what? Didn't help at all. So, okay, back to Google. So it's not the heating element. Most likely it's a vent, okay? And so I buy the vent. I get the vent. I do the same thing. I, I disconnect the water, disconnect the power. I disconnect the supply lines. I do everything I need to do, take it all out, replace the part, put it all back in, run a cycle. Still nothing. There's still, I think they're even worse this time. So I'm frustrated. So I go to the thing that it most likely isn't, but it was the only kind of other thing that, that the internet said that it might be. And so it might be that, that the fan on the motor is broken. So I do the whole thing again. I take it all out. And by this time, I should just like quit being a pastor and just become an appliance repairman. I could spend way too much time investigating dishwashers. But I tested the fan motor and it wasn't the fan motor. So what is going on? So I'm like, it's midnight. I'm crisscross applesauce on the floor, just staring at my dishwasher, being like, what is going on? And I saw on the dishwasher, there's this little part where you put like laundry or the dishwasher detergent that said rinse aid. And I'm like, I wonder if I just need like jet dry or something. And so I went to Walmart and got jet dry. I put it in there. It was like $3 and it fixed it. It's perfect. That's all that was missing. I thought, that, I thought the solution to this was going to be so complex. And these are like months of me buying these parts and doing these things. And all I needed was a little jet dry. It was, it was right there. And sometimes what seems to be, you know, a complex problem aren't really com isn't really complex at all. Now, don't get me wrong. There are seemingly complex problems that are layered. They are actually complex. They're overwhelmingly difficult to solve, no doubt about it. I mean, look at the state of things in the world, and, and, and I imagine that you could come up with just a handful right off the top of your head that are really complex, really difficult to solve. And maybe there are things in your life that that's the case. That's you. Things for you are complicated. Your relationships are complicated. Your family is complicated. Life for you is complicated, and you don't know how to entangle it all. You don't know how to solve that thing because solutions aren't always simple. But sometimes they are. Sometimes saying sorry goes a really long way in a broken relationship. Sometimes acting with just a little bit of humility can solve a lot of our relational problems. A lot of financial problems in our life can be solved with, with a budget. 
A lot of spiritual problems in our life can just be reconnecting with the presence of God, spending time with Christ, doing the things that we know bring us into his presence, confessing sin, worshiping, reading the Bible, gathering like you're doing tonight. Sometimes the answers to our complex problems actually aren't that complex. Over the past few weeks, uh, we've been searching through this New Testament book called 1 Corinthians. And so we're going to go back there today. But before we dive into the book, we need to get a little bit of context of what's happening. Because when we read the Bible, we have to understand that whether the genre is history or allegory or poetry or narrative or whatever it might be, that the author of that letter or that author of that piece of writing was writing to a particular group of people at a particular time in history who were going through particular problems. And you have to understand those particulars in order to really understand what Scripture means. Otherwise, there's a good chance you can take things out of context. And so you have to ask first, well, what did it mean to them, the people who are reading this first? And then you can understand what it means for us because the Bible can never mean what it never meant. Okay, the Bible can never mean what it, didn't, what it never meant. It would be wrong to read our maybe current political climate or your situation or your you know, cultural leanings, whatever it might be. It would be wrong to read those into the Bible in order to draw out its meaning. That's, that's an error called proof texting. Proof texting is when someone appeals to the Bible in order to prove or justify a predetermined position about something. It's like you have this, this lens on a particular cause, cause X or cause Y, and you come with that lens to Scripture, and you look for something to justify that, and then you use that piece of passage to justify your position or your cause. That's called proof texting. And so you see that all the time with TikTok preachers or someone with a particular agenda in mind. It's this weaponization of the Bible that so happens happens to align with all of their personal beliefs and opinions. And so to read and live scripture faithfully is to understand its context, then submit to its teaching regardless of the rub that it might have against culture. And that's a really tough thing to do, but it's honest. And that's important. You need to be honest when we come to scripture. So 1 Corinthians. The city of Corinth was this major port city in the ancient world in the first century. It was an economic powerhouse. It's littered with temples all over the place to every type of god you can imagine. All the Greek gods, all the Roman gods. The most notable temple was to the goddess uh, Aphrodite, who was the goddess of love. There was a thousand female slaves, read, read temple prostitutes, who were in employment at any given time at this temple. So you mix this temple, this kind of, this hub uh, of this goddess of love, mixed with all of this money in this city and these throngs of temple prostitutes in a port city where sailors are coming in and coming out of every day. And it's like this powder keg for really deviant sexual behavior. And that is finding its way into the church. But that's not the only problem that the Corinthians were, were working through. Now, Paul spent a year and a half with this church, pastoring it, planting it, but then he had to move on. He had a call on his God, of God in his life to go and preach to, to all the Gentile world, so he had to eventually move on. But, but as he moves on, he's getting all these reports, man, this church is a mess. He's getting letters being like, you would have no idea what's happening. Like, you, you wouldn't believe it if I told you what's happening in this church. In fact, it's most likely that this church is the most dysfunctional church that we read about in all of Scripture. That's the genesis of this letter. That's why Paul is writing it. He's addressing from a far off way the problems that are happening and plaguing this church. And we're not going to be able to look at all of the problems in depth tonight. And over the last few weeks, you've, you've touched on some of them. But the overarching problem happening in this church was division. It was disunity. Division over leadership. Division over sex. Division over syncretism, over chaotic church services. Their churches would have been just wild to attend. And there's some major theological issues that were causing division in this church. I mean, it was messy and it was complicated, but the solution to it might surprise you. The solution was really quite, quite simple. So to begin this letter, Paul begins in a way that he, he often begins many of his letters. He says this, Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. That's you, by the way. 
sanctified in Christ Jesus, and you have a call of God on your life, which means you have a purpose. God created you for a reason. You are called to be his holy, his set-apart people. And he says, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that being you. It says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning I, I, I preached in our morning services really all this idea about sanctification. And so I'm not going to go way over it if you catch it this morning. But really briefly, to be sanctified just means to be made holy, to be, to be set apart. And so right off the bat, Paul is telling this church, he's setting them up. He's like, this is what you're called to, people. Remember that. So as I deal with all these problems, remember this. You're called to be sanctified. That's God's calling for your life. A lot of times we think about what God is calling you to or or God's will for your life. We start getting to all the weeds like who should I marry? What job should I take? What program should I take in school? That's what we're always asking. But what we should be asking is, God, what's your will for, for my life? Well, to be sanctified. You're calling me to be holy and blameless. We don't miss the forest from the trees on this, okay? It would be the worst to, to figure out, you know, the right spouse, but to not be holy. You, you got to get the foundational things right first. God is calling you first and foremost to holiness, to be blameless, to be pure, to be set apart for his purposes. In another letter to the church in Thessalonica, he says this, it's God's will that you should be sanctified. You don't have to guess about what God's will is for your life. It's right here. He wants you to be sanctified, to pursue righteousness, and to run from sin at all costs. That's God's revealed will for your life. And as Christians, we are obliged to to obey God's revealed will for us. But we have the option to disobey. We have the option to resist God and what he wants for our life. But the good thing is, you don't have to guess. You don't have to wonder what God's will is for your life. So, He wants you to be sanctified. How does this happen? Paul again tells us to the Thessalonians, he says, may God himself, it's not you, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through, meaning no part of our life is off limits to God. May your whole spirit and your soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's God who does this work. It's God who makes you holy. But you can resist the work of God's spirit in your life through apathy, through disobedience, and ultimately through sin. But it's God's will for you to be set apart. And so this is the, the picture that, that Paul is trying to paint for this church as soon as he gets going. He's like, everyone remember, don't forget what you're called to. This is what you're called to, holiness a deep level of holiness. And then Paul jumps right in after that into really the big problem that is dividing this church, which is division. He says this, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there may may be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you, What I mean is this, one of you says, I follow Paul, another, I follow Apollos, another, I follow Peter, still another, I follow Christ. So what was happening here is after Paul left the church, different teachers and different leaders would come through uh, the city of Corinth. Remember, it was an important city. It was one of the first churches, important. And people would come in and, and just try to pastor, try to teach, try to ground these new Christians. But what people were doing is they're picking and choosing their favorite leaders and becoming like super fans. And they're becoming almost cult-like followers of these different leaders that are coming through the church. And they're talking bad about one another. And there's division. Be like, oh, you're team Paul or oh, you're team Peter. It's kind of bizarre behavior. And Paul's saying, are you kidding me? The church isn't, the church isn't a popularity contest. And then over the next few chapters, Paul kind of talks about really what the church is. The church is a community of people who are committed to one another, who are centered around Jesus. Not its leaders, centered around Jesus. That's what this is here, the project. It's a community of people committed to one another that's centered around Jesus. Not the personalities, not the giftings of its leaders or its teachers. Pastor Jeff, Pastor Reuben, Pastor Brett, the leadership team, they are wonderful people, wonderful servants of Jesus. But it doesn't revolve around them. It revolves around Jesus. So there's no reason for division among you, Paul is saying, because we have unity in Christ. And whatever can divide us is so overshadowed by what unites us. And what unites us is this message of Jesus, the gospel. And the gospel, quite simply, is this. Number one, that God created you for a relationship with him. 
You're not an accident. You're not smart mud. You're not a monkey wearing pants. You were formed by God for purpose, on purpose. And that purpose is a relationship with him. But there's a problem. And you know it. I know it. We feel it. There's a disconnect. If we're made for a relationship with God, why does God feel so far off sometimes? Well, the, the Bible answers and says, well, well it's, it's, it's sin. Sin is when we do the things that we wish we did not do or we don't do the things that we wish we did do. Another way to say it is, is the greatest commandment in Scripture is to love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, and soul and love your neighbor as yourself. And when we wrong God, when we wrong our neighbor, when we wrong ourself, that's sin. What's your name? Stephen. Me and Stephen. We're buddies. Okay? We're our buddies. If I lied to you, if I talked about you behind your back, there w- we kind of wouldn't be cool anymore, would we? There'd be this wall between me and Stephen. That's what sin does. It creates this barrier. And so sin has created this barrier between us and God. So that's the problem. God has created you for a relationship with him. But there's, there's a sin and it's this problem. It creates this barrier, this disconnect between me and God. And here's the thing is that sins can't be repaid by good deeds. But that's what people try to do. And that's what virtually every philosophical system and religion tries to do. Okay, there is a problem. Everybody knows that. There's this disconnect and chasm between us and God. And so most solutions in most religious systems are, let's just stack up our good deeds as high as we can. We'll stand on top of them, and maybe God will take notice of us. Christianity is so much different. It's, it's so different than that because it says, no, you can't stack up your, how high can you stack up those good deeds? You'll fall short every time. So instead of reaching up to heaven and trying your best, God has come down to you where you are at in the person of Jesus. So paying the price for your sin in order to remove that barrier, Jesus takes that on himself. And everybody who believes that, believes in the finished work of Jesus on the cross, has life that starts now and it lasts forever. The gospel is the most unifying force on the planet. There is absolutely nothing like it. Look around you. And what other place can you find people who are so different? Different race, different gender, different class, different interests, different friend groups. But yet we're all here together under the banner of Christ. There is no other force on earth that is unifying as the gospel. There's some that are close. Like sports, sports is close. Music is pretty close too. If you were an Oilers fan during the playoff run last year, and you get it, right? You can see it throughout the city. There's something about it. Man, the bars are packed. Flags are on every car. People are talking. People who don't even like hockey are all of a sudden like into it. And it was so unifying. Unless you were a Flames fan living in Edmonton. Then it didn't feel very unifying. You were on the outs. Yeah, sports is powerful. But there are some hard lines in it that divide one another. I'm from Calgary. I could care less about hockey but I say I'm from Calgary and people already put me in a different class. Some of you have instantly tuned me out. I'm not surprised you might not just walk out right now. Sports, it's unifying, but there are some really hard lines. The gospel, though, it's amazing. There's nothing like it. it breaks down every barrier that could be put up between us. Now, the gospel unites us particularly in three ways. First of all, all human beings, regardless of mental capacity, class, gender, race, age, whoever else you want to dice us up and separate us into groups, all human beings are made in the image of God and therefore possess equal value and dignity. There isn't another religion or philosophy that can provide that outcome. Secondly, the Christian doctrine of sin teaches that all human beings are united in their rebellion against God. All have fallen short of the glory of God. So we're united both in our image of God bearing nature, but also we're united in our rebellion against God. But thirdly, and most importantly, as Christians, we're united through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Galatians 3.28 says this, There is neither Jew nor Gentile or slave or free. There is not fa- male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Scripture isn't saying there's no such thing as a Jew or, or, or a male or a female. That's not what it's saying. It's not erasing these differences. But, but what it's saying is our, our greatest point of solidarity with one another is a redemption in Christ. And so Paul is like, guys, get with the program. 
You're united under Christ. Put these divisions behind you. And then Paul delivers to them the sternest warning that we have in the New Testament over this. Like Paul's taking this very serious, this division. He says this, Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. Someone go get a tattoo of that. Isn't that a nice verse? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. This passage is often mistakenly referenced to people who commit suicide. That if you commit suicide, well, that is like this, this unforgivable sin. That's not what, that's not what Paul is saying here. That, that, is a, that, that is flat out wrong. It's a hyper-individualized reading of this passage. Because... Paul is saying, you collectively, the church gathered in Corinth, the church here at the project, so you is plural when you go into the Greek. It's not singular. He's not talking about individuals. He's talking about the church gathered. Paul is warning anyone who would attempt to cause division within his church. That's the warning. And the warning and the punishment for dividing this church is heavy. He says God will destroy that person. And maybe... It's, it's worth exploring that, but it's also worth exploring how much God must love his people, his church, if that's the case. So much so that he calls his church his bride. I cannot think of a more loving or intimate or passionate image. God loves you collectively, his church. He calls you collectively here and around the world his bride. In recent years, there is this sort of rise amongst millennials to, uh, in particular, not just millennials, but to use the church sort of as a, as a punching bag, to talk bad about her, call her out, to abandon her, to blame her, to divide her. And of course, people have their reasons. But Paul is saying here, be very careful. Be very, very careful. God loves his church, and he wants you to love it as well. But this church in Corinth, it's, it's a mess. It's divided. And it's not just divided over celebrity preaching. Paul moves on to talk about sexual immorality. It's dividing the church. And you guys talked about this a few weeks ago. But there are people sleeping around in the church. One guy was sleeping with his mother-in-law, which is like, ew, right? It's like so gross. But, but it was like okay in this church. There are people in the church who are fine with it, saying things like we're free in Christ and, and God's grace knows no bounds. And Paul's like, pump the brakes. Like, yo, this is not cool. You're misunderstanding grace. It's not anything goes. There's this expectation of sexual purity that contributes to your holiness. And if you're a Christian, sexual integrity is one of the major ways that we respond to Jesus' grace. It's not anything goes. Jesus died for those sins. Don't think that you can find a loophole. That's abusing Jesus' grace. You know, Paul says again to the Thessalonians, he says, it's God's will that you should be sanctified, that you avoid sexual immorality. It is that important. Sexual integrity, or I should say the lack of sexual integrity, undermines your holiness. So this church has problems, big problems. And again, it's not just leadership. It's not just sexual purity. They have divisions over communion. They have division over food laws. And they have division over some really foundational theological ideas. And you might look at this church and be like, there's, it's too complex. These problems are so layered. I don't even know where to start. It's so messy. And if I was Paul, honestly, I'd be like, yo, I'm moving on. I don't got time for this church anymore. It's kind of a lost cause, but he doesn't do that. And we're about to see why. In chapter 12, Paul starts to talk about what's happening in their church services. And what we learn about this Corinthian church was that they're the most spiritually gifted group of all. Like, seriously, their, their worship services would have been buzzing. Like, wild spiritual gifts at work, like, out the wazoo. I mean, people are getting healed. People are speaking in new heavenly languages. This gift, this spiritual gift called tongues. People are prophesying left, right, and center. I mean, it's spiritual gifts to the max, but, but they're being misused. And so Paul teaches them this. He says, now to each one, okay, each one, each single person here, the manifestation of the Spirit, how the Spirit reveals himself in you, it's given for the common good. That's what it's for. Spiritual gifts are for the common good. 
To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by the same means, by the same uh, Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. One time I had um, an ankle injury that was so brutal. It was my deltoid ligament here. I came down on someone's ankle in basketball, and it just like just tore everything right up so much so that like just touching it would just like send pain all up my legs. And so uh, I was playing college basketball, but it wasn't like your actual college basketball. It was a Bible college basketball team, so it's pretty much like junior high basketball. But anyway, <clears throat> if you played Bible college basketball, no offense. Um, that was more for me. Um, and I remember I was out for the season. Uh, it was supposed to be 16 weeks in this air cast. It was just brutal. And my friend Paul prayed for me three days in, and I took off my air cast, which I shouldn't have done. I don't, I don't suggest doing that, but I did it, and he was healed, just like that. I've, I've prayed for people, and again, I'm not like some magic healer. I don't have some super voodoo powers, but I've prayed for people, and they've been healed. Backs and, and sickness. And, um, but then I prayed for my dad, and he still died. And I prayed for my mom, and she's still injured and goes through chronic pain. I don't really know why God does things, but I see that he does things, and these gifts are at work in the church. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still other the interpretation of tongues. I remember I wanted the gift of tongues just because I thought it would be really neat. I wonder what would that be like, and I didn't get it for like eight years. And I was by myself at a camp, and God just gave me this, this language. And I don't know what to tell you other than it's from God. I wouldn't, I wouldn't just do it because it's awkward. It sounds weird. But it's mine that God has given me, and I'm so thankful for it, and it's, and it's, and it's real. And he wants you to have that too. All these, are, all these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So spiritual gifting clearly is not the indication of a healthy church because this church was operating in spiritual gifting more than any other church, but they were also the most sinful and most dysfunctional church that we read about in the New Testament. But here's the thing. We do believe that these spiritual gifts are still at work. I've seen them at work. And their purpose, as Paul says, is for the common good. In other words, God gives spiritual gifts to people in order to build his church. And that idea, I, I understand, might be strange or other or, or new, and I get that. But when these gifts are in operation, being used to benefit others and not to show off, which is a weird flex, and not to draw attention to how spiritual you are, man, these gifts are so beautiful when they're operating within the church and they point to this God who loves and is active in the building of his people. But in Corinth, it's chaos. It's just chaos, and spiritual pride is rampant. So after talking about spiritual gifts in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 13, he moves on to love, and he says this, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, and give over my body to hardship that I might boast, but I do not love, I gain nothing. So 1 Corinthians 12, we have spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 13, we have this chapter on love. Then back to 1 Corinthians 14, he's back to spiritual gifts as if like he lost his train of thought, but he didn't. Here's what happened. It's a love sandwich, okay? Our spiritual gifts are the bread. Love is the delivery system. Spiritual gifts are, are, are languages of love from God. That's the purpose of spiritual gifts, to promote, to display, and to reveal love. And so check out what he says in 1 Corinthians 14. And so right now we're getting red hot close to the solution, to the complications in the Corinthian church. And this is what he says. He says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people, but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. The problem in Corinth and the division that's caused by leaders, you know, uh, by following different leaders, the, the division caused by, by sex, the divisions over the chaotic worship services or syncretism or, or lack of the theological agreement, all of those things, they're all sourced out of one thing, which is a lack of love. 
all of the problems are just symptoms of the root, which is a lack of love. And so Paul says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts because spiritual gifts are all about love. They're all about noticing others, about lifting others up and building them up. And then Paul, in a real strange move, he places in the hierarchy of spiritual gifts, he places prophecy at the very top of all of those gifts. We're to eagerly desire and somehow prophecy, of all things, is going to unite this divided Corinthian church. And that's a scary word for a lot of us, right? Prophecy. What comes to mind when you think of prophecy or a prophet? Probably some dude with a receding hairline screaming, right? Something like that. Predicting the weather or an outcome of an election or, or something like that. I remember being in a church service when I was a teenager and like my church was pretty hyper charismatic and, and they'd bring in like these kind of self-declared pro- prophets and, they, and sure they were, but it was always scary for me because I always thought like they could see through like x-ray into my soul and see all my sins. I totally always thought they were going to like call me up on stage and just like, I don't know, do something to me. I was always scared of prophets. Um, prophecy can be a scary word, but that's not at all how the New Testament describes prophecy. We've kind, of, we've kind of taken that word and that idea and we've just like, we've just thrown it to the wolves because this is the clearest definition of prophecy in the New Testament. And this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4.13. The one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. So a prophetic word strengthens, it encourages, in comfort. Pastor John Finocchio is someone who I, I, I read and listen to, and he says, a prophetic, he says it this way, a prophetic word builds up, stirs up, or cheers up someone. That's how Paul defines prophecy. If it doesn't do that, those three things, it doesn't build up, if it doesn't stir up, if it doesn't cheer up someone, well, it's not prophetic, it's something else, because that's always what prophetic word does. And anyone can do that. Anyone can build up someone in the Lord. Anyone can stir up someone. Anyone can cheer up someone in the Lord. And, and here's why prophecy can cure the Corinthian woes. Because prophecy requires you to notice, care, and pay attention to someone else's life. Prophecy requires selflessness. To build up, stir up, or cheer up someone else, you can't be thinking about yourself. You have to be thinking about them. So this is what's going to bring unity to this divided and dysfunctional church prophecy. And so Paul continues, he says, anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I'd rather every one of you prophesy. Paul's saying anyone could prophesy because anyone can build up, stir up, or cheer up someone in the Lord. Prophecy is the greatest gift because it's the gift of love. The very thing that the Corinthians lack. So prophecy is this, if you're taking notes. Prophecy is the love of God bursting off someone's lips towards someone else. If I can have have the band come up. So if you're new here or you're new to church, you're like, what are we talking about? (laughs) Pastor Jeff asked me to talk on this. It wasn't like my own, I'm not like some like weird prophet who wants to come and like spread some prophecy stuff. (laughs) What on earth is this guy talking about? I'm not a prophet. I don't have the gift of prophecy. I can't do that. Yeah, I mean, you can. It's a spiritual gift. It's from God, right? It's God working that through your life. It's his gift to the church. And it's a way that you can serve and build up the church. So don't excuse yourself from this conversation. Paul is saying, I want every one of you to prophesy. And so here is my advice to you about prophecy. For the love don't overcomplicate it. Don't overcomplicate it. Paul didn't. We tend to, but Paul didn't overcomplicate it. Here it is, okay? You ready for it? Here's prophecy. When you see something good or godly in someone, say something. Say something. When you see something good or godly in someone, say something. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that right now. It requires a little bit of nerve, but it's not hard. It's not complicated. And so before I came up tonight, I was praying. And so I thought of you, Abby. (laughs) 
Abby, I see God's work in your life. Wherever you go, it's just like peace goes with you. I don't know if you know Abby, but that's true. Abby, I see God at work in your life every day that you show up. And I know that life is maybe complicated right now and you're juggling a lot of balls and you're trying and you're striving and it's hard. But know that in this season, God is developing in you such godly integrity. And God is creating you to be such a godly woman. Thank you for your obedience. Thank you for your faithfulness. And when you get famous, don't forget me. <laughs> Brett, Pastor Brett, you're my friend. I think you're everyone's friend. I think you have more friends than anyone I know. I work out with Brett at this gym that I've been a part of for five and a half years. This guy just shows up and he knows more people than me. I see at work in you the fruit of the Spirit. All of them. I see love, I see joy, I see peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and especially self-control. I've seen that a lot. And that's not you. That's God at work in your life. It's clear that you have prioritized spending time in the presence of Jesus. And the, the reason that you probably have so many friends is because you spend so much time with your best friend, Jesus. You're learning from the best. I see that in you. I just want to encourage you, don't stop doing that. God still can take you to deeper places in your friendship with him. There are places and things about God that you have no idea that he's going to reveal to you and you're going to be able to tell other people about that. So keep going, man. Do you see how that can solve the problem of disunity? Do you see how doing things like that, if that's happening within the people here in this dysfunctional church, do you see how that can solve so many problems? Prophetic word stirs up, builds up, and cheers up someone. It's the love of God bursting off your lips towards someone else. So here's the takeaway. When you see something good, when you see something godly in someone, say something. Practice it tonight in the lobby. Do it. Work up those kind of five seconds of intense courage and just go and do it. Just open your mouth and see what happens. You don't have to have it all lined up. Just say it, what you see in someone. Practice at school, practice in small group, practice at work. And so the question is, how can you, this isn't a message for anyone else, this is a message for you. How can you build up, cheer up, or stir up someone in the Lord? Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for Jesus. I thank you that he's at work in his church. I thank you for this word. How we don't have to complicate this, this idea of spiritual gifts. It's you empowering your people to build your church. And we just get to be a part of it. We just get to enjoy it. We just get to experience your love and your joy and your peace. And we get to bring that to other people. And what an amazing thing that is, God. You are so good. So I pray for this place, this project. God, I pray that it would be a place of prophecy that people would stir up, build up, and cheer up one another. They would use their words, Lord. They would use their words as a vessel of love to build one another up. I pray this in your good, your perfect, and your holy name. Amen. Amen. Why don't we stand together?